Grandpa. Your grandmother's taking a nap up there. They sound like bells. What are they? What are you doing with them? Well, once in a great while, Barbara Ann, when I was just about your age, my mother, your great-grandmother, would let me do what I'm doing now. If I'd been a very good boy and was very careful. See? These are heirloom goblets, Barbara Ann. They were made here in New England, especially as a wedding present. They're so very old that if you added up my age, and your age, and grandmother's age, they would still be older than that. Have you been a very good girl? I think so. Would you like to try? Oh, yes. All right. Gently now. Very gently, like this. That's right. Now, no harder than that. Now, you try it yourself. Now, if you'll be just that careful, you can do what I did many years ago. Play with it all by yourself. I'm going out to the hammock, Barbara Ann. Your grandmother's Sunday dinners really make me sleepy. Promise me you'll be extra special careful? Yes, Grandpa. I right, do. Easy now, easy. Those are very precious glasses. What? Who said that? I did. Right here in this red goblet. Look closely. Perhaps you can see me. But how can you be in the glass? Very simple. The name is Jarvis, Deming Jarvis. I made this glass many, many years ago. And in anything worthwhile anyone makes, he leaves a little of himself forever. It is what they call his heritage. Once in a very great while, to a child who hasn't yet gotten all confused with the grown-up world, that little bit we leave in what we make might come alive, just as I have done with you. We leave a trail. In New England, it's the oldest trail in the country, and part of it is mine. Would you like to see it? Could I? You sure can. It's called the New England Heritage Trail. Heritage Trail, as intimate, as personal as the hands of a child gently enclosing a priceless heirloom, as vast and awe-inspiring as the White Mountains of New Hampshire in winter, as history-laden as the battlefields of the Green Mountain Boys of Vermont, as brilliantly beautiful as New England autumn in the gracious villages of Connecticut as exciting as the beaches and the sea itself, the hundreds of miles of beaches that stretch from Bridgeport to Bar Harbor, as quietly charming as the spring blossoms from Rhode Island to the farthest hills, as meaningful to the future of a nation as the bridge in Concord, Massachusetts, where a revolution began and a country was born. For of all the trails in our country, of all the heritages, this is the first, because this is where it all began. And this is where those beginnings can still be seen. There's only one thing needed to see them in addition to what is already there, the clear, uncluttered imagination that once we all possessed. For a heritage is made up of more than a place. 
even a hallowed place like Plymouth Rock. It is made up of the people whose feet hallowed the place, the feet that stepped ashore in this new world for the first time on this rock. People who built the houses now so lovingly restored, who lived in them and used many of the tools and utensils there today. sailed into the unknown on the Mayflower, of which this Mayflower is the exact reproduction. For as Deming Jarvis pointed out to Barbara when he made his glass at Sandwich on Cape Cod, he left a little of himself in it. And the people who used the tall forests of New England to create their homes, they too built something of themselves into them. And the two together, the material and what the people did with the material, those create the heritage. They grew together into villages, early outposts against the forest as the country spread inward from the shore. Villages which, even in restoration, speak of a primitive courage and will to survive. Villages that are the roots for much which came later. Villages which one's imagination can people as it will. All such places and things speak of a known and understandable heritage. But there are others hidden in the woods of New Hampshire and Western Massachusetts, where even a child's imagination is baffled. For these structures of stone, built on bedrock with cunning patience and craftsmanship, are true mysteries. Was this an altar stone where sacrifices were held perhaps 3,500 years ago by Phoenicians from the east? Were these structures built by people that far predated all known settlers in the western continent? Were there, Mr. Jarvis, were there people long before Columbus? No one really knows, Barbara. No one. Someday, perhaps, someone will find out. But one thing is quite certain. From the earliest days we know of, people found and used stones of various kinds for many things. Marble, quarried far underground in the hills of Vermont, known today all over the world. Granite, from the world's largest granite quarries in Barrie, Vermont. other granite from the hills of Maine, where a whole town turned out to quarry some stone for a very special purpose. More than 15,000 tons of stone went to Boston to become a handsome building. Yes, sir, and from a lot of other places, stones were brought to pave the streets of most of the big cities. But you know, the streets had to be there before they could be paved. And in the case of Boston, that's quite a story in itself. Folks don't know much about the dates of the caves in New Hampshire, but they do know that this is how Boston looked about 4,000 years ago. That hill over there is Beacon Hill, and the bay in front is Back Bay. The Indians, they're using brush to build fish weirs, traps. That was tough work 
but it meant that the Indian families would have fresh fish, one of the things they really depended on for food. Many, many years later, other Indians got to know the Reverend William Blackston. One of the earliest New England settlers, he built his house on the southwest slope of Beacon Hill in 1623. Today, part of the land he lived on is a public park. Its name is Boston Common. Well, about the time I was making my glass down on Cape Cod, folks in Boston ran out of land. So they decided to fill in Back Bay and make some more. They called in a Vermont man by the name of Munson, and he built a railroad all the way in from Needham to haul gravel, and he did the job. It took him a little over five years, but it made quite a difference. All filled in. Some nice homes in the distance along the Charles River and one of the handsomest new buildings to be put on that new land. The Boston Society of Natural History in 1861. Today, the building is still there, still quite an example of how they built in those days and still serving a useful purpose as a fine store. Been going up there too, the great Massachusetts Institute of Technology. That's where it began before it moved across the Charles River to Cambridge to become an outstanding part of the New England heritage. Education has always been a big part of that heritage in colleges and medical centers where people come from all over the world to attend. In 1939, when they began to build a new building here, they dug up what was left of those fish weirs. They unearthed more than 65,000 stakes the weirs were made of, all sharpened by stone axes. This is how that new building looks today, the New England Life Building. And when you see it, you'll see the whole story I just told you in four dioramas in the lobby. The building's being built the way the back bay was filled in. The home of the Reverend William Blackston. The Indians and their fish weirs. And that stick from the fish weir look familiar to you, does it? Why, it's just like this one. It sure is. And your granddad is mighty proud to have it. The material and the people and what the people did with the material, that is the heritage. And much of it is found in Boston. The home of a silversmith in the North End, born and raised here to be chosen for an unforgettable role in our nation's history. The lines are familiar and only a little imagination brings them to life. One if by land and two if by sea and I on the opposite shore will be ready to ride and spread the alarm to every Middlesex village and farm. The shot that began the long, long task of making the country safe and strong for a civilization to flourish. The task that when completed made possible all that came afterward. Unspoiled villages, homesteads of a kind seldom now seen, religious tolerance begun for one religion with a synagogue in Rhode Island, for another with a church and a fence in Vermont, and for still another here in Boston. Cities of all sizes, capital cities, Providence, Rhode Island, Augusta, Maine, Concord, New Hampshire. Hartford, Connecticut. Montpelier, Vermont. Boston, Massachusetts. Mr. Jarvis? Yes? Was that shot really heard all around the world? In a manner of speaking, you might say it was, Barbara Ann. 
Suppose you were just to slip aboard that ship. You'd see how things did travel around the world. Ready? Ready, Mr. Jarvis. Okay, here we go. Whee! This is fun, Mr. Jarvis. And fun is what it should be. There's a lot that's deep and serious and inspiring about the New England Heritage Trail. But following it, seeing things at first hand instead of in pictures or on maps or in books, that's fun of the finest kind. Far as I know, no one gets too old to enjoy seeing the real thing. And you don't find anything out of history any more real than this recreated seaport at Mystic, Connecticut. From a lot of ports like this, with its copper shop, smithy, weave shop, bank, and so on, all up and down the New England coast, trade was built. Trade that made New England one of the best known names in every port in the world. Things have changed along shore since my time, but the names haven't. Point Jude, Narragansett, Providence, Rhode Island. Whether you skip along like Barbara or drive over the finest of highways, the names, the places are all magic, all exciting. Yes, the heritage takes countless forms. One of them, the fishing fleet bringing to harbor foods that have long been a staple for the nation. Who had courage enough to eat the first lobster? No one really knows. But from Connecticut to Maine, nothing is more of a trademark of the thousands of fine eating places strung along the Heritage Trail. Another magic name, Provincetown, on the outermost defiant tip of Cape Cod, poked like a bent thumb into the Atlantic. Today, a haven for artists. And many years ago, the first landing place of the Mayflower, before Plymouth was reached. In Boston, you get a different idea of what man has done and is still doing with the materials he found here back in 1620. How from Boston, a name for integrity, business ability, financial responsibility spread throughout the world. From the three hills of 4,000 years ago to the changing, dynamic new city of today is a long step. But to one who travels the trail, understands it, it is the kind of step that was inevitable, that is the forerunner of still other steps yet unmarked. It took and still takes constant vigilance, constant awareness to protect that growth. One of the symbols of that vigilance, the oldest commissioned warship in the United States Navy, the USS Constitution. The symbol itself has changed, but the meaning hasn't. In Gloucester, the country's oldest fishing port, neither the meaning nor the symbol has changed. They still go down to the sea in ships. Rockport's trademark, the most painted lobster shack in the world. Motif number one for every artist in a famed artist colony. It takes hours, days, weeks, months, even a lifetime to travel this shore where the excitement of today stands side by side with the memories and statements of yesterday. Only a few miles away from Portsmouth, New Hampshire, in Franklin, the birthplace of Daniel Webster, the massive witch's elm tree planted by his father in 1765 still grows. Within, a symbol of the frugality, the thought for the future that typified his breed of man. From 
Portsmouth on to the eastward, the trail continues through names storied in memory. Agunquit, its cliffs, its beaches. And one of the earliest of the summer playhouses. Kennebunkport, with its fabulous collection of transportation from a bygone era. Portland, with its 365 islands, each with its own history and place in Casco Bay. And one home of special interest, the home where the author of The Midnight Ride of Paul Revere spent his youth, Longfellow. The names go on. Bath, Booth Bay, Thomaston, Rockland, Camden, Castine, each with its own mysteries, its own histories, its own relationship to a heritage born from the sea and of the sea. Fun? Indeed it's fun. For you, for your folks, for anyone who wants to know how all this great country began. It's a story of man and the materials he found to work with. But there are some times, as in the fall, when the materials themselves are all you need. It could be the White Mountains of New Hampshire. It could be the Green Mountains of Vermont. It could be the famed Mohawk Trail joining Massachusetts and New York. It could be the hills of Connecticut or Rhode Island. It could be any single tree in any single spot, in any single village. The colors of fall in New England play no favorites. This part of the heritage is given to all, native and visitor alike. And perhaps the sheer beauty of it explains why many New Englanders, having sought and found their fortunes elsewhere, return finally to the place where the fall is more than just a time on a calendar. And when the crisp autumn night is laced with the smell of wood smoke, there is the fellowship of other travelers and the kind of food for which New England is justly famous. A fellowship found in country inns where George Washington might have slept or in ultra-modern resort establishments kept open for those to whom there is no time in New England like autumn. Autumn in the mountains and the hills summer along the shores of the ocean and thousands of lakes. And spring, the time of year we always really looked forward to, Barbara Ann, because spring came after winter, and winter in my time was pretty difficult. It was the time of great stillness, when nothing moved, when the inside of your house and the barnyard were about all you saw. But when people found a way to slide downhill on a pair of skis, that heritage of winter stillness changed so you wouldn't recognize it today. You know, there's a little cottage in a valley in Norway where they say all this started. Folks claim that that's where the first skier lived. If that's where it did start, it's like a lot of other parts that go to make up this heritage trail. A great many of them, like us ourselves, came from other countries, and we changed them and built them into our own heritage. Yes, this is the pattern of winter anywhere along the New England Heritage Trail. Western Connecticut, the Berkshires of Massachusetts, the snow-clad shoulders of the Green Mountains, the rugged notches and frowning headwall of the White Mountains, the hills and slopes of Maine, There are other patterns, exciting patterns, as new and thrilling activities become part of the heritage.
Each season has its own special appeal. As individual, as challenging as the drive of a slender boat through a choppy sea. Thrilling, picturesque, exciting. The New England Heritage Trail is all of these. It is, too, a sensitive and beautiful thing, for it is the wonder of the past, entrusted in the hands of the future. <laughs>